Becoming the president of Kenya can be a dangerous admiration. Several top politicians have been shot, killed, or their political careers destroyed over rumors or plans that they intend to contest for the country's top seat. In all these cases, culprits were caught and prosecuted. But in real sense, they were just part of the gun. Big men in these plots remain a mystery. On the 5th of July 1969, Thomas Odiambo Mboya, then Minister for Economic Planning and Development in Jomo Kenyatta's young government, arrived in the central district of the Kenyan capital city, Nairobi. He was looking for a perfume, but little did he know that an assassin, Nashon Jenga, was on his trail. He had been hired to take him out. If he did it, was it out of conviction? Then you under conviction of what? What did he? So there, there could be, it's possible that he was a gun for hire. Because, because the, the, court the court then did not exploit the, the issue of the motive. The question did not come. They, 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 no, they, you are interested in whether you, you held a gun and fired. Details reveal that on the 5th of July 1969, Jenga and his unknown accomplices had trailed Mboya from morning when he left his home in Lavington Estate in a chauffeur-driven Mercedes-Benz KME 627, which was his official car. They trailed him past James Gishuru Road, Gatanga Road, and then Agwing Skothek Road. The minister ended up at Panafric Hotel, Valley Road. He was here for breakfast. They wanted to take him out right in the hotel's parking bay. But they hesitated. The place was full of foreign tourists who were on their way to the Nairobi National Park. But Njenga and his group knew they would still get opportunities to execute the murder. They knew very well his schedule for the day. Boya was going straight to his office at the Treasury Building and later at a chemist on Government Road, now Moy Avenue. 9.30 a.m. Tom Boya was in his office. The killer and his accomplices waited. At around 1 o'clock, the minister went to the underground parking of the Treasury Building. He was accompanied by his private secretary, Otieno Nundu, and his driver. But he chose to drive himself to the chemist. Jenga and his accomplices followed closely. He parked right outside the chemist, walked around greeting some few people and then went inside the chemist. The shop had already closed for the weekend, but they opened for him. Hey, I know many of you are asking why Tom Boyer decided to do his errands by himself. If I was the one, I would have sent my bodyguard or my aide at least. But Tom Boyer decided to come by himself. Now, let me tell you why. The Chinese, or the owner of Chinese chemist, the Chinese 
were his friends. And many times, as you see in these pictures, he would come along Government Road, now Moy Avenue, to have a chat with his friends, the Chinese. And on the day of his killing, it was not different. The gunman patiently waited. The minister had a little chat with Mrs. Mohini Semichani before he bought a lotion for dry skin and a perfume, then decided to leave. As Thomas Mboya was busy inside Chinese chemist purchasing stuff, Nashon Jenga, the assassin, was looking for the perfect position to unleash the lethal shot. At this moment in time, everything appeared normal in the Kenyan capital city. People were moving from one point to another. Cars were roaming the streets until Tom Boyer stepped out of the chemist. A waiting Nashon Jenga unleashed fire shooting Boya in his chest, a bullet that took him out. Two bullets on target. The loud shots rose above the noisy city. The minister fell on the ground. I looked and it appeared that the assassin knew exactly where he would be at what, at what time. Yes, he did. He did. And... Um, Yes, the two of them knew each other. At least that became very clear. And uh, maybe it might explain Boya's uh, reaction when he was coming from the chemist. Eh? Then he sees his friend holding a gun. <laughs> Instead of ducking, he just... <laughs> I mean, they, they, they raised a lot of questions that um, Njenga was not just anybody. Mm -hmm. It is also possible that they had talked before. The gunshot plunged the city into chaos. It was this confusion that gave ample time to the assassin to escape. But Nashon Jenga would be arrested later and prosecuted. At this point in time, Tom Boyer, who had been shot twice in the chest, was lying on the floor with Miss Chani performing first aid on him. A few minutes later, Dr. Rafik Chadri, a friend of the Chinese, arrived in an ambulance and started resuscitating a heavily bleeding Tom Boyer. What did you find there? It was your... When I rushed to the scene, I uh, found uh, Mr. Tom Boyer uh, lying flat on his back uh, he was unconscious I've, and I uh, couldn't find his pulse, uh, hardly any respiration. Uh, he was bleeding. Uh, he had been shot in the uh, front of the chest and uh, uh, straight away I started the resuscitation and uh, uh, started the mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. Doctors tried all they could to save the life of Tom Boyer, even as they transported him to Nairobi Hospital. They employed all the skills and experience they had. And we got into the ambulance, we continued the resuscitation till we got to the hospital. And uh, there I handed over uh, in, in, to the doctors of the hospital, Nairobi Hospital. In fact, I'd stay around. It was time for the specialists at Nairobi Hospital to try their best, placing him on oxygen support while trying to stop him from bleeding profusely. But unfortunately, Tom Boyer succumbed to gunshot injuries. The bullet had completely damaged his vital organs. 
According to doctors, the first bullet caught the outer, causing severe bleeding while the second hit his shoulder. Thomas Joseph Odiambomboya, aged only 39, had breathed his last. The gunman had succeeded in his mission. Tom Boya was no more. Grieving Kenyans soon gathered in huge numbers at the Nairobi hospital, but on welding police were called in to keep the crowd at bay. Men and women, crying uncontrollably, flocked the facility. Following his arrest, the assassin Nashon Jenga was prosecuted and convicted. He was sentenced to death by hanging. But it was during his arrest and prosecution that a lot of things came to the fore. For example, Jenga asked, why don't you go for the big man himself? Now from that time to date, the question of who the big man was still lingers. We let us all avoid speculation. I don't want to prejudice the cases, subjudice, and I don't want to go any anything that would block the way in this matter. A South African spy uh, was interviewed and claimed that South Africans might have had something to do with the assassination of Mr. Mboya. You well, have commented on this, I know. I commented uh, last night and uh, I would like to repeat the same thing that um, we have no knowledge of this and I cannot definitely say anything that affects a sister state. The mystery of the big man and why Mboya was killed sparked uneasiness in Kenya and beyond. Jenga was apprehended by law enforcement on the 10th of July while he was at his workplace just a short distance away from where Mboya was shot. As per the court evidence, it was revealed that Njenga committed errors following the shooting of the young minister. He was so nonchalant that he left behind the briefcase containing the weapon used in the killing at his rented residence in Ofafa Jericho estate before returning to town. It was disclosed in court that Njenga treated his friends to drinks and enjoyed a night of revelry. After unlocking the briefcase, police discovered a Smith & Wesson 3.8 revolver along with seven rounds of live ammunition. According to the police then, ballistic tests showed it was the gun that fired two bullets which took out Mboya. And the bullets found with the gun matched those that killed Mboya. During that era, the specific weapon was exclusively accessible to law enforcement officers assigned to VIP protection tasks as per official regulations. Jenga initially claimed that he had bought the gun from a friend, but refused to disclose the identity of the alleged friend. He later changed the story, claiming that a friend had given the briefcase to him for safekeeping and did not know that it had a weapon. Charles Njonjo was the attorney general. He instead blocked any effort for Njenga to be had. He cautioned Samuel Warihu, the lawyer representing Njenga, against making remarks that he deemed to be political during the murder trial. Njonjo said, and I quote, Every day there are occurrences of murder. There is no reason to think this one is any different. So we anticipate no dramatic displays from the defense. 
the pre-trial comments made by Judge Alfred Simpson also caused concern for the defense as he stated his intention to handle the case like any other murder trial regardless of the victim's social status which drew attention. When the ballistic report was presented by Assistant Commissioner of Police John Bell who was leading the prosecution team, the trial judge disregarded the inquiry into how Njenga ended up possessing the murder weapon. After ignoring the big man mentioned by the gunman, the government started to unleash conspiracy theories here and there. Well, Tom Boyer was among men that had been listed as possible successors to Jomo Kenyatta, the first president of the Republic of Kenya. And the, the forces who feared his ability to maneuver things, manipulate, were also not sleeping. So in some way he was outmaneuvered or outwitted by his rivals, political rivals. That's what we were talking about, about the politics of Kenyatta's death. Eh? So if he appears as if he's going to go, you have a lot of things happening. Mm -hmm. And in order people just looking for positions to see who is now ahead or who can be removed. Have you heard of the phrase Kiambu Mafia? Well, this was a group of politicians, very powerful politicians, that coalesced around Mze Jomo Kenyatta, Kenya's first president. So powerful they were that they had a hand in almost every decision that was taken by Mze Kenyatta. So this group of politicians was blamed of having a hand in the murder of Tom Boyer. But what is shocking is that since then, no judicial inquiry has been constituted to look into the matter. The question is, who was the big man in Jenga's story? All these are um, explanations. If possible, then the, the, the interests of some external forces and the interests of some domestic forces might have coincided. And in that coincidence, then uh, he disappears. So the Jomo Kenyatta administration started to push a narrative that the gunman, Nashon Jenga, had learned of a plot to assassinate the president. And that Jenga had used Mboya's gun to take him out. They also said that Jenga acted alone. But what was shocking then and now is that the administration of Mze Jomo Kenyatta chose to ignore the big man mentioned by the gunman. My name is Enoxicoli and I am the Kenyan historian.